Well, welcome to the San Diego Air and Space Museum today. Uh, we have a very, very special guest, uh, uh, a NASA astronaut, uh, Woody Spring. Uh, I'm going to read here just for a second so I don't screw this up for, uh, for all the fans who are listening. Uh, Woody Spring spent more than 165 hours in space aboard the space shuttle Atlantis, including 12 hours performing two EVAs or spacewalks. Uh, Woody is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where he earned a degree in engineering. After graduation, he served two tours of duty in Vietnam, the first with the famed 101st Airborne Division. Uh, the second tour came immediately after flight school, where he served as a helicopter pilot with the 1st Cavalry Division. When he returned from Vietnam, he earned a master's degree from the University of Arizona in 1964. And Woody, I got to insert something here. My brother is a retired Army helicopter pilot. Uh -huh. so, being the Navy pilot, I have the disease in the family as we would uh, joke around uh, with, our, with our dad. Uh, after a short stint as flight test engineer, Woody attended the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School at, at Pax River, or NAS. Pa Paxit River, River, yeah. Okay. Before returning to the Army's flight test facility at Edwards Air Force Base to complete four years as an experimental test pilot before joining NASA. Uh, today, he is a professor at the Defense Acquisition University. Uh, Woody, thank you very, very much for uh, joining us. Uh, we were able to talk for a few minutes before this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And Woody is a, uh, a true friend of the San Diego Air and Space Museum of our entire region and the nation and uh, makes himself available uh, on many, many occasions to help us inspire uh, young people. So, Woody, welcome. Uh, thank you. So, um, okay, so as we get into uh, uh, space, you know, we've got a very interesting uh, launch coming up here on the 27th of this month uh, with Elon Musk and the SpaceX gents. Uh, before we ask you some questions about what it's like getting ready to go into space, what do you think of that program and how excited are you knowing that we're going to be heading back out there and we haven't been there for about 10 years? And how excited are you? I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. It's, it's long overdue that the United States resumed its ability to launch our own astronauts into space. Since 1911, we've had to, you know, pay the Russians to take us to space. And anybody that went to the space station had to learn Russian. And that's where their training went on. So it, it's long overdue. Not that Elon Musk didn't do a wonderful job coming to the rescue, if you will. But he beat out Lockheed Martin and Boeing and NASA themselves to, uh, to actually give us the launch capability back again. That's awesome. Good. What do you like best about, uh, about the Musk program? <clears throat> I, I, he, he did what a lot of people thought was impossible. Um, they said, you know, you can't, you know, even with $100 million backing you, you're just not going to be able to start with a bunch of rookies and be able to build spaceships that will safely go to space. And he did it. He had a couple of failures up front. They learned from them. And uh, you know, he was kind of like early days of NASA where we had just a bunch of very, very smart people dedicated to doing the job. And he's, he's definitely a slave driver for his folks, but they love him for it, too. Well, that's great. And uh, <clears throat> certainly I think uh, everyone really enjoys watching uh, their, their particular program and, uh, and their aggressiveness. You know, they, uh, mm -hmm. I think we all believe they want to be there. And they're and they're trying to do it right. Uh, okay, so um, uh, you know you've uh, you've talked a lot about preparation for going into space, and uh, you know can you can you talk a little bit about leading up to a launch, leading up to you know the, all the training that you go through, the years of training, as you know, and just kind of you know the the, the Woody Spring view of. Uh, of how do we get, how do we finally get in that, uh, that craft? Okay, well, <clears throat> so I won't start with how do you get selected as an astronaut, although I answer that question often with, with folks want to join. When you join the astronaut office, you start off with two basic jobs. One is training to learn whatever you're going to fly on. If you're a scientist, what your experiments will be and things like that. Uh, so the, the, the first job is to train, and then they also give you another it's a part-time job that goes with training. In my case, it was a shuttle avionics integration lab doing regression, regression testing on software for the shuttle. Okay, and I did that for 18 months, and then I moved to the vehicle integration test team where I'd fly to the Cape Kennedy Space Center or the Cape Canaveral area in the T-38, and then work being a surrogate crew for the shuttle 
uh, track the anomalies, track what's going on with it, and then come back every week again and, and brief the crew on the status of their shuttle, their payloads, and things like that. That was just a wonderful job. I'd come back from that, and my face would hurt from smiling so much, being around space shuttles and ships and things like that. All right, so depending on you and what they need, they'll have you doing those two things, training and then working. Um, then about a year and a half before your launch, at my point, that was like three and a half years into NASA, they finally name you to a crew <clears throat> with about a year out to go. And then you start training on your specific mission uh, and get to know your crew and become, you know, good friends and learn how to work together pretty well. Um, about a month before flight now, they separate you from your family. Uh, you move from your home to a trailer inside a building at Johnson Space Center. This is uh, health stabilization and isolation. Get you away from the kids because wonderful and you miss them and all. But, you know, we want to see somebody that's not, that's fairly sickly, it's a first grade teacher. It's just, you know, the, the kids just share everything they got. And we just don't need to pick up coming down with chicken pox and stuff like that just before we, we, we launch. All right, so you do that for maybe a month before flight. Three days or so before flight, we flew in a formation down to a, a Kennedy Space Center and landed there and go into crew quarters like every other crew has done since, uh, since the Gemini program. Those three days are filled with a lot of briefings on your system. Yeah, working out, jogging. Oh, they got they got all kinds of stuff left over from the uh, from the Gemini and Mercury days. Somebody wanted to do archery, so we got an archery set indoors. Somebody wanted to do indoor bowling, we got that too. Darts, you name it. Yeah, uh, there, there's things to keep you busy. <clears throat> but then then you finally get down to the day of launch, and uh, oh, you got the tr uh, day before. You got a traditional. Everybody goes out to the uh, what is it? The uh, the beach house. The beach house. And at the beach house, you get a chance to, you know, just see your wife and family again, but not the kids. Uh, you know, it's just one more time getting together as a crew. It's just a tradition. But the day of launch is when you, you, know, you finally uh, get up in the crew van and head out to the pad. Now, morning took place at 4.30 in the afternoon for us because we were NASA's second night launch. So you climb into the van, you ride out to the pad, and uh, we get out to the pad maybe at 6.30 for a 7.30 launch. So it's, uh, this was the day before Thanksgiving in 1985, full moon, but it's already dark out there. And as you look up, you approach this thing, the stack is huge. So the, the whole world is illuminated and there's the shuttle on its two white solid rocket boosters on the orange external tank, lit by Xeon searchlights, the full moon out there. And the thing is just awesome, it's gorgeous. So we all climb into the elevator and go up to the flight deck, the launch deck rather, you know, on the top of the mobile launcher platform. And then you get to walk around these 15 foot diameter solid rocket boosters. On that is hung the external tank and then the shuttle's hung on that. And this thing is not inert. This thing is alive. It's vibrating and just, just vibrating with energy and it's, it's girdling. You know, it's charged with liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. The liquid hydrogen boils at minus 420 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a 70 degree Florida day, so it's starting to, you know, it's, the gases are starting to heat up a little bit. The hydrogen goes over to a burn pond. We got dancing flames going 35, 40 feet high. The Xeon lights on us. The thing is gurgling and rumbling at you. Says, oh man, this is so cool. Under each of the engines, there's a baloney bag of water to isolate the energy that these things are going to cook out, uh, put out from the pad itself. And there's also the, the water tank that, that slushes like 35 million gallons of water on the deck just to isolate the gantry from all that energy. Well, after a few minutes of walking around there, we get back in the elevator and go up to the flight deck. Uh, just north of there is where they got these three gondolas if you have to bail out something going on that's survivable, you climb into those and hit a paddle and it just slides you down, break through the fence if you need to, or get into a little tank. There's an Army APC there, Army Personnel Carrier. <clears throat> we never did use that, but it's there. Um, just like you would do if you're going for a long car ride, the best practice is everybody go to the bathroom. So one deck up from that, there's a toilet, there's no door, it's been burned off. There's no toilet seat. It's been burned off. And the hot and cold water pipes look like a plumber kept this blowtorch on them for, you know, 100 hours. Every color of the rainbow and bent in seas just from the power of that thing. Oh, man. All right, you get back down and it's time to climb in. All we had to do is just put on our helmets. Uh, we just wore Nomex flight suits, light blue, not this color, but the light blue ones. Now they're wearing pressure suits. But, uh, yeah, just put on your helmets. 
and crawl into your location. Uh, it, it, you have to crawl into a seat that's like laying down on the floor so your back is on the floor because we're getting ready to launch. So they got platforms in there so you're not kicking switches and things like that. But you get in, you get strapped in, put your comms on, and then the, the support crew, which is one of the jobs I used to do, backs out, shake your hands, see you guys in a week, and then they lock the hatch. So that's the prep for it. Okay, so you're a young girl or a young boy, and you're watching and listening to this. Okay, would you, um, what makes you say, I want to go do that? Um, when, when I'm still a teacher, I'm a college professor, and many times, and I'm, I introduce myself as a, as a former astronaut test pilot, and, you know, after class, some of them will come on up and say, I'd really like to do that program, would you, would you mentor me on what to do on it? Sure, let's talk about it. You know, are you a risk taker? Uh, I don't know. I've never done anything risky. Okay. Then why don't you find out if you are? Go do something reasonably dangerous, but same. Um, you know, so, well, like what? Well, the last guy I did this with was uh, we were up at uh, uh, China Lake. And uh, so he's trying to search for things. And I'll say, well, how about mountain climbing or skydiving or a lot of things? And one of the other students says, hey, I'm on the mountain rescue team because we got people on the John Muir Trail all the time get themselves in trouble. Why don't you come join us? We'll teach you safely how to do mountain climbing. It'll be a chance to figure out whether you're a risk taker or not. But if you're not a risk taker, this is not something you want to do. I, on the other hand, enjoy doing things safely that other people might think are dangerous. I mean, before I joined NASA, I raced motorcycles. I love mountain climbing. I love whitewater river running, spelunking, scuba diving. You know, but I did them sanely. Uh, and part of the astronaut inter interview that you might do if you get to broad down, you're going to spend two sessions with a shrink. You know, and he wants to know if you're a risk taker. Yeah, I love to go 100 miles an hour through school zones. Wrong answer. Not that type of risk taker. That's stupid. You know, I'm an intelligent risk taker. I love to do dangerous things safely. And that's what they're looking for. So if that's you, if you really enjoy an adrenaline rush and doing cool things, then for heaven's sake, go for it. If you're really not, if you're much more comfortable being on the ground and supporting something like that, we need hundreds and thousands of engineers to run the consoles and, and make the systems work for us. So you can be part of it. You just may not want to be the, the test pilot or the guy doing it. Good. I think that's, uh, I think it's very appropriate. Uh, you know, I can relate to, you know, uh, landing on an aircraft carrier at night is not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it, and it's not something that you necessarily think about when you're a sophomore in high school. No. You know, you, you just don't think of those kinds of things. So I think that is a, uh, that's a, that's a great uh, series of metaphors. Okay, for some people who won't know what spelunking is, though, you've got to tell them what it is. Spelunking is cave diving or cave, cave, cave exploration. Uh, I got my master's in University of Arizona in Tucson. And I read in a book that there was a cave that nobody had done anything with. That's a commercial cave now that they take people through, but then it was not. And said, you got to go down uh, toward uh, Nogales, and just after you pass the Greyhound track, hang a left in there, and about a mile in, it's, I'm looking for an entrance to a cave. It, it turned out to be about a one-foot hole in the ground. Really? Am I crawling into a coyote den or what? So we went in there with headlights on, and finally, you just realized, I'm in a limestone cave. You, you had, we ended up having to go get ropes and come back, because it's, it's a long descent to get into that, but it's almost a pristine cave. It's gorgeous. Absolutely lovely. Again, it's a commercial cave now, but yeah, that's cave exploration. So pretty much the shuttle was kind of a little bigger. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, a little bit. Bigger. Well, that's another thing I want to make sure you're not claustrophobic. Right. Uh, during my slideshow, I, I show uh, the, the, the ladies from the class of 78, and they're in front of the personal rescue sphere. It looks like a giant beach ball. And if you make it in for, again, the interviews, then uh, that's one of the things they do is you stick you in this 36-inch diameter, 36 inch diameter beach ball, and just leave you sitting alone in a dark room. Uh, you're wired for sound. And if you're claustrophobic, uh, get me out of here. Uh, you know, most people go to sleep. I did. You know, so, oh, that's a comfortable position. You know, just wake me up when it's over. Yeah, just get the temperature right. Yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, they strapped you in. Describe the launch. The, the launch is, is again, it, 
Yeah, I only had one launch, you know, so this is incremental disclosure to me. So you're sitting there on your back and, you know, people ask about, are you, were you afraid getting ready to launch? I says, no, I'm just, I've been dreaming of this for the last, you know, really 20 years of my life, but absolutely for the last, you know, 300 and 400 days. So no, I want to launch. Yeah, a hundred million dollars worth of launch or something like that. Hey, I'm paying seventy-five dollars a night for my wife's hotel room. I got to launch, you know, whatever. It's one of those things, you know. And so you're sitting there, and and I've been part of the launch thing because I was on this vehicle integration team, listening to all my friends launching and taking their turn, and uh, you know, so you, you're just listening as go through the countdown. There's built-in hold, but very slowly we transfer control from the, the, the launch control complex at Kennedy Space Center to the shuttle, all right? Now we've got the computers and the shuttle are in charge. You start the, the, uh, the, the uh, fuel cells, now the electric is coming on board. Later on, we'll start the APU, the auxiliary power units, now I've got hydraulic power. Now the vehicle's starting to rock and roll and shake as they gimbal the engines to make sure all those things are right. Finally, you're getting down to the final countdown. Uh, we start the main engines at about five seconds before liftoff, and they come up to full power at three seconds. And all of a sudden, from in a relatively quiet environment, all of a sudden, it's this huge roar, you know, and it's like lions just screaming their heads off in the room behind you. Oh, my, this is it. Whoa, and the vehicle just starts vibrating with energy. Three two, one, and it's like somebody hit the back of your chair with a sledgehammer. Liftoff is instantaneous, boom, and you watch the gantry go like that out of your window, and you know you're leaving planet Earth one way or the other. It is awesome. We, uh, at this point, you don't really feel that much other than this one G that presses you, this three Gs that press you back into your seat. We accelerate the three Gs, and now we're going through the thick part of the atmosphere. If you've ever stuck your hand out a car window at 60 or, or 80 miles an hour, okay, it'll blow your hand back. So, you know, we're going through the thick part of the atmosphere. The shuttle's going through load relief on all its elevons and control surfaces, and it feels like you're in a pickup truck full of sheet metal going over railroad track. It's banging and rocking and rolling. Holy cow, is this normal? And the answer is yes, that's normal. For the first two minutes, you're going through, we call it the first stage. At the two minute point, uh, you're at about 65,000 feet going Mach 3, and the solid rocket boosters are just about burned out. So you feel the energy all of a sudden starting to dissipate. Uh, the commander throttles back to about 1G, and it feels like you're floating, then bam! And you can hear the solid rocket boosters being blown off, and you can watch them pull out the head window, one of the, the main windows. You can actually watch them go down a little bit. Okay, I want you to repeat something just for a second. Two minutes, 65,000 feet, and you're passing three times the speed of sound. That's right. Okay. But you're above, at this point, you're above the sensible atmosphere. You're right, right at that. Right? And then as soon as the solid rocket boosters are gone, uh, the commander spools back up to three G's of acceleration, and for the next six and a half minutes, you stay there at three G's. It's relatively quiet after the solid rocket boosters, but all of a sudden, you know, at six and a half minutes later, it gets really quiet when the main engine stops. We've got Miko, main engine cutoff, and I still remember taking a, a pencil out of my pocket and putting it in front of me, and it floats. Ah, we're on orbit. Mary Giggles on the intercom, you know. And now it's time to get out of your chair, get your helmets off, your boots off, store your seats, get rid of the comms equipment, and we got to get to work. First thing you got to do is open the payload bay doors, activate the toilet because everybody's been holding it for the last, you know, almost hour and a half now in a position where you're on your back being vibrated like crazy scientifically designed to make you have to go real bad, all right? Uh, 45 minutes later, we have to circularize with another burn to make sure we go into a circular orbit instead of just coming back home in a parabola, but you're on orbit. And uh, for us, we had to launch our first satellite on the sixth rev, so there you go. Go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Two, one, booster ignition. And the final liftoff of Discovery, a tribute to the dedication, hard work, and pride of America's space shuttle team. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Right. 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 
Space Shuttle now rolling over onto its back for the eight and a half minute ride into orbit. Discovery now making one last reach for the stars. through the area of maximum pressure, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it goes supersonic. Discovery Houston, you are go at throttle up. Commander Steve Lindsay acknowledging the call from Capcom Charlie Hobai as Discovery's three main engines throttle back up. Lindsay is joined on the flight deck by pilot Eric Bowen, and mission specialist Al Drew and Nicole Stott. Mission specialist Mike Barrett and Steve Bowen. Discovery's three main engines are burning fuel at a rate that would drain an average swimming pool in about 25 seconds. The engines combined with the solid rocket boosters produce more than 7 million pounds of thrust. One minute, 50 seconds into the flight, we're standing by for separation of the twin solid rocket boosters. Discovery now traveling 2,695 miles an hour. It's altitude 24 miles, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center 29 miles. Booster separation confirmed. Discovery's guidance is now converging as the shuttle's onboard computers fine-tune the flight. Wow. Nice description. And, Quite wonderful. Uh, and, and for all of those who have been to Disneyland in the old days, uh, it was an e-ticket ride by... Uh, uh, by Definitely Anderson. an e-ticket ride, yeah. They don't even know what that is anymore. That's an anachronism. No, exactly. So we're dating ourselves just a bit. Yep. Okay, so... Okay, so, uh, you know, there you are, you're out there, and now you see, you know, you know what's coming into our future, you know, that, that uh, we're going to return to um, our own ability as a nation, of course, and uh, uh, to service the uh, uh, International Space Station, uh, but, uh, but you can certainly see the yearning and hear the yearning for deep space exploration, go beyond whether it's back to the moon, Mars, etc. Why, why is it so important, certainly as a leader of the world, as John Kennedy challenged our, our nation a number of years ago, why is it so important to our world, our nation, that we get back out there amongst them? Uh, well, we've never really lost our lead in space, although it is being challenged pretty, uh, pretty steadily right now. Uh, we need to get into deep space for a number of reasons. Uh, one is we only know about the, the, the universe and what's possible materially uh, by what we found on Earth, basically. We got the periodic table tells us things are possible, but in these thermal furnaces of neutron stars and big stars, that's where we get the heavier elements, iron and gold and things like that. So we don't even know what is out there that we might find that is not on Earth. Uh, the Chinese have a, a, a corner on the market for rare earth elements. We need to find those. You mentioned our leadership in space. Uh, we need to retain the leadership in space. Uh, the free world wants to be partners in space. And they're used to our leadership in space, which parlays to leadership back on Earth. So if we have to go against adversaries again, we don't want to fight anybody alone. We don't want to fight anybody but if we have to fight, we want it to be coalition. So leadership in space brings us back to leadership on Earth. Um, in terms of deep space, uh, the future of mankind depends on us being able to get off the Earth at some point. Uh, about a few billion years in the future, our sun is going to burn out. Uh, there's three rocky planets inside you know, between Earth and, and Mercury and uh, should, Mars, Mars, and Venus. Those are three rocky planets, kind of sister planets. Venus has got a runaway uh, greenhouse effect. That could happen. Mars has lost its liquid core, and it's a solid rock now. 
Earth has still got the liquid core, which lets us have a magnetosphere, which protects us from the sun's uh, solar winds. All right, at some point, we could lose our liquid core. At some point, we could have an asteroid come and destroy the Earth. So if the human race is going to survive past our sundown, we've got to get out of this solar system and into other solar systems and galaxies so that we can seed the universe with not just us, but with the plants and animals from Earth. Um, we're probably not the only intelligent life form out there, but we're the only one we know. If we want to survive, this is part of our future. And it starts with going to Mars, but we have to prove the technology to go to Mars by going to the moon. It's, it's what they called in Apollo times, standing on the shoulders of giants. You take what is known before, you add to it and build it. And it's a wonderful way to go to space. It's what we have to do. Did I answer that one enough or keep talking? No, you, no, you, you did great. Uh, because I, you know, I certainly think everything you're saying is, is true. Uh, uh, you know, it's a very, very exciting time. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like my personal belief in reincarnation. And it's very simple and it's very basic. I hope so. And yeah. uh, uh, I'd like to believe it too. That's right. That we'd all like to, uh, to do this again because it's going to be uh, uh, more exciting for those young boys and girls, okay, in their futures to, uh, to make a difference, to be on the shoulders of people like you and the others okay, who have gotten us out there, and now it's time to, uh, to get back out there. And certainly uh, mm -hmm. the current administration's uh, commitment uh, to being back on the moon by, I think, 2024, uh, you know, is, is very commendable because I think it's something that, uh, that is important to us as a, as a people, certainly as a world also, but as a people. I've used in many of my presentations, you'll get a kick out of this one, uh, the challenge we, uh, we, we Americans uh, – uh, encountered is we reached the West Coast. So we couldn't say, go West, young man, was the phrase of the day. And so we had to go somewhere. And thus, uh, you know, it's up, it's down, uh, somewhat mm -hmm. underwater. Certainly, we can find a, a, you know, find out a lot uh, by going underwater as well as, as well as into space. But space is where it all starts to make sense if we can start, you know, putting it together. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I do remember uh, uh, probably the funniest thing I ever heard in a response uh, was uh, Charlie Duke, who you know very well, is a good friend of yours. Okay. And, you know, it, it was the rock collection protocol, okay? And Charlie said, he says, you know, he said, it was so complicated, I just picked up one of every color. And, uh, and, and it was just kind of telling about the importance of figuring this all out you know, which you've been a, a, a very viable team member uh, to do. And I think what I've enjoyed so far, and I'm going to enjoy, enjoy a lot more, is you dig it. You know, you're, you're into it, and um, uh, you liked everything about the program and still, and still do. So, okay, so um, future generations, okay? You know, those, uh, I always, uh, uh, once again, I will tell people, we have to believe there's, not just only a single you know greatest generation there have to be future greatest generations because mm -hmm. it makes people like you and me and 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 all of us uh you know want to ensure we pass on the right kind of incentives to those young people so you're talking to to some young people now and what would you tell them why is this important to their lives you're talking space or stem or all the above I think, you know, maybe all of the above, space, STEM, you know, STEM as a stepping stone, okay, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, you know, all of that stuff that is, uh, um, uh, I was gonna, that not the other stuff, in a weird sort yeah, of way. Yeah, not the easy stuff. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Well said. No, I enjoy talking STEM. Uh, I think it's tremendously important. And STEM uh, is, just, just to remind everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, STEM. <laughs> All the high school and elementary school kids know STEM because they've already been beat around the head, their shoulders with it. But STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. These are the harder topics unless you've got the aptitude for it. Uh, this is necessary for us as a nation because we are dependent. As our nation, our infrastructure is all dependent on the science and the technologies, uh, the electrical grid, 
the fuel, the, the fuel distribution, uh, the communications that keeps our commerce alive. We need all of this. Our adversaries are prepared to take it away from us if they have to, whether it's a cyber attack or whatever. They are planning to and capable of at some point in the future. So we have to have our next generation of folks who have enough engineers and scientists and mathematicians to actually keep the infrastructure going and make sure that we stay viable in what we're doing. Okay, so that's part of it is we need this as a nation. The other part that I like about STEM is I, I think you got maybe two flavors of kids out there. Uh, those that are that are actually uh, ha have a good background. There are one or more parents have been to been to college, or you know, mom and dad have enough money that they're pretty well set up. You know, we know you need to go to college and things like that. For them, I want to help them at least understand if you've got the aptitude for math, science, technology, go there. Okay, it can be excited. But then there's the other group, and, and it's a continuum, you know, whatever. Uh, mom and dad didn't go to college. They may not have, you know, they may have menial jobs, uh, first or second generation in the United States. A lot of these folks, nobody is telling them you can do it because if I don't know, I can't teach you what I don't know. So I can't tell you how important college is if I never went. So somebody has to help them understand if, if you want to be more than homeless or have a menial job for the rest of your life. It's about school. It's about getting an education. And if you've got the aptitude, for heaven's sake, science, technology, engineering, and math. So this is part of the message. It's not for everybody, but for those that it is for, for heaven's sake, let's go. I mean, I'll help mentor you guys if you need it. I actually, I actually was tutored, you know, back in, I think it was the sixth grade when I wasn't getting some of the algebra that we were doing. But once I got it, you got to get the basics. But once I got it, from then on, I was I was ready to go. But you got to get them over that hump. And if you can do that, that's 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 what I'm trying to get going on this stuff. It's so exciting. But you know, somebody's got to show you the way or let you know you can get there. Anyway, that that's that's at least a short shot at it. No, I, well, I think it's great. Um, I, I think it's um, uh, your message. You can do it is absolutely critical and i always add one more thing it's your turn ah, you know, that's in, the next generation that's right yeah. in the sequencing yeah. that is occurring you mm -hmm. know um you know you've been there i've been there etc well now it's their turn yeah. so this is this is important because they're 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 going to carry it on and i need someone to step up and take their turn that's right that's exactly right. And, you know, we look at the Air and Space Museum as uh, helping connect the dots, uh -huh. okay, certainly of how we got to here. Uh, but we know we have to be uh, about everything you're talking about today, and that's that we have to be about the future because we have to help them vision it because visioning the future isn't always natural, you know, to everyone. And uh, so uh, what's that? No, I'm just chuckling. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, it, it is. And sometimes just a little bit of coaxing at the right time in life. You know, uh, uh, you know, I had a friend of mine years and years ago uh, who, uh, who was going, who went through BUDS training, you know, basic underwater demolition school, SEAL oh, yeah. training, and he rang the bell. Okay. He dropped out. Mm. Uh, this was a very, very dear friend of mine growing up. I would have told you he was not the one to drop out. And I, and I asked him, his name was Bill. I said, Hey, Bill, Come on, explain to me. I know you were, you know, we were in Boy Scouts together, all that kind of stuff. He said, I didn't have someone at the right moment to kick me in the behind, mm. okay, to give me that just little push that every so often uh, we all need, okay? Really good. And that we all need. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit, you know, and you, you alluded to this a while ago risk, because some people would, claim that uh, others in our society have become risk averse. How important is it to, to really, and I don't think we chatter, but I want to expound on that just a little bit, the, the willingness to take on and accept risk. You know, there are times when you're out there alone, all by your, that EVA you're out there on, okay, and it is risky. Everything about it is risky but you did it. Uh, 
first of all, I didn't think that the EVA was particularly risky. NASA treats it as, as risky, uh, I guess because not only you're in the shuttle in space, but you're then gonna step outside. But each of the technologies are very mature. We know how to do spacewalk. We know how to build the suits. To me, the risky part of doing the space station was um, the fact that NASA wasn't prepared for as many as we wanted to do. And then you start scaling it up, uh, you have to be ready. Uh, at that point, when I went to space, I was, I was the EVA extravehicular activity or spacewalk lead getting ready for Hubble telescope repair and space station. And, you know, when they realized we were going to do a space walk or two of them really planned, oh, you're going to do a spacewalk. We got to get gloves. I actually wore Pete Conrad's gloves that he wore to the moon. You've got to get gloves and they almost have to be a jewel fit for you. Even if you and I take the same size gloves, every joint in your finger has to have a little hinge over it. And I can do a little bit expanding and contracting on that to move them, but you can't have too much down in the crotch of your finger or it'll hurt when you work it. So uh, we, I, those were Dave Clark gloves. Have you ever seen those light green earmuffs that uh, some folks wear? That's David Clark. That company is about... 40 miles north of my house in Rhode Island. So I went up there, why do you guys get out of the business? Oh, we need you back in it. And uh, so actually they got back in it and they were doing gloves again for us and things like that. But the gloves have to work, but the suit is pretty good. Uh, we keep improving on it. Like I didn't have the little jet pack on mine. We've got that for space station because if I jumped away from the shuttle with all my energy, they could come get me. They just scooped me up in the shuttle. If I fall off the space station and I'm not tethered, you can swim or do anything you want. You're pushing against space, so you're not moving. So you have to be able to self-rescue. But this whole thing about risk, um, I, I heard it this morning, I think they're talking about it. You know, somebody said that, you know, to go to space, a million things have to work together and work right. But only one thing can break it. Well, we go mute, triply redundant. We do as much as we can to make it safe. But even if you're 10 nines of reliability, 99.999, there's still a chance. But you got to understand, there's a chance when you drive to work. There's a chance when you walk outdoors. There's a ch Life is risky. Choose your risks, but don't be afraid. Make it as safe as you can. If it's still not an acceptable risk for you, don't do it. My wife, this is, this is COVID-19 is going on. My wife wants to go visit the kids in Illinois. All right. You know, you wear your face mask. You get just actually called NASA. I said, what do you guys recommend? And they say, don't do it. You know, is you could probably do it safely and come back, but going through the airports, doing all this stuff, you're liable to pick it up. Then you'll take it to visit with the kids and your grandkids. They'll take it and give it to their grandparents. You've just started the cycle going again. Why? If, it, if it's an emergency, then do what you have to. But if not, do the sane approach and, you know, be a little bit risk averse because you don't know if you're subject to this thing or not. And at 75 years old, I probably am. It, it, it gets the codger class faster than it gets the youngsters on it. So, you know, that's just being risk averse. So that's, that's being an intelligent risk taker. But, man, there are so many, whether it's mountain biking or climbing a mountain to watch a sunrise or a sunset. I mean, people ask, you know, what was your favorite thing on orbit? It's, just, it's looking out the window. It's watching the sunrise and the sunset every 45 minutes. Oh, do you feel closer to God? I feel close to God when I see that but no more so than when I climb a mountain or I'm flying an aircraft at sunrise and just watch the sun break through the horizon. Just, oh, it is gorgeous. I mean, it, yeah, that's what does it for me. So the, the risk, if it's worth it, you know, it's, it's, you control it, but, you know, I, I, I never felt I was in danger when I went to that space. Good. Maybe that was blind luck. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I think that you uh, you kind of have to believe in the system. Okay, yeah. you know you uh, uh, you know as you know uh, uh, you know being a you know being an aviator, uh, you can't sit around and worry about things that uh, you know yeah. that you can't control. You Do know? your job. That's that's exactly <laughs> Why the aircraft. Right. And uh, that's right. And just and you're gonna believe that everything's gonna you know you know work like it uh, like it should and when it doesn't you'll take it on at that time now i have to say one thing though you mentioned a million a few minutes ago now i thought because uh, of you as a uh, as a helicopter pilot i thought that was the definition of a helicopter was a million <laughs> parts flying in close formation there you go. Through, through the sky so that's just a internal joke between us 
Um, and you, you, know, to, you know, when, you know, we're talking about risk. When, when they when they want you to be an aviator, when you want to be an aviator, and they accept you into this, they're going to teach you how to be safe. They really do. It's the basics. You got your checklist. Uh, you've got the Navy uses any anonymous any mouse. You know. Anybody can call up and just explain that problem they had and what their solution set was. But the bottom line is continue to fly the aircraft, do which, yeah, you know, we can do these things safely. We really can. You just have to study and do your job. Yep. Yep. But they do train you. Yep. Well, and, and there are processes, you know, you just, mm -hmm. you know, if something does go wrong, okay, you're going to start going bam, bam, bam. You know, we used to, uh, you'll get a kick out of this one. I've told this one, to, you know, around the museum that uh, you know the master caution light is going off in front of you and lights are in the cockpit are going on and you're going uh, i may have to do something here because it's uh, you know being uh, becoming significant and you know we had member bold face emergency rope memory and all that oh, kind of yeah. stuff. and uh, uh you know we always used to say the first procedure was to wind the clock now see you'll get a kick out of this one and somebody would say well why are you going to wind the clock well, the answer is, so you don't do anything wrong. So you take that extra 10 or 20 seconds, and before you shut that engine down, you know, you've made a sound decision to shut that engine down or whatever procedure that... Is it know, the correct engine that I'm shutting down? Yeah, is the and, one that's on fire? No, no, not the good one. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so um, when you look at um, space travel, space in general whether it's iss deep space or whatever mm -hmm. and you were to uh you were to say um what has it given us most in other words you know i i've often used uh, aviation and space of course as a technology overlay that if you look at december 17 1903 mm -hmm. the wright brothers to today and you combine all of aviation and space it's an overlay of the of the uh, technological development of really the <clears throat> world. So, okay. So if you were to kind of look at a few things that you thought, this is what space really gave to us, what would they be? Oh, there's a, NASA used to publish uh, called spinoffs. Uh, it was a monthly. It was a monthly, then they went to every six months or so, but it was just a big volume of all the things. It started off with Tang, Teflon, uh, freeze-dried foods, I mean, food preservation, Freeze drying was something that hadn't been done before. NASA basically invented that. Uh, we got remote uh, medical, so you know, remote doctors, remote uh, t t telemedicine, which was invented. Uh, the various sensors, whether the heart monitors and things like that, crystal watches for really good timing. Um, oh, management paradigms for being able to, to bring things like the space shuttle together. Uh, built in every state of the nation coming together. They invented technology readiness levels, uh, software readiness levels, manufacturing readiness levels that the, the, the Department of Defense still uses today. Um, the management capabilities to pull all these things together, microprocessors. Uh, you know, I could probably make a list of a thousand things if I wanted to think about it hard enough. But the communications uh, infrastructures are just, it, 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 it's such a huge program and they were so innovation and they still are uh, i think and it's that, answer, and that one that's in everybody's garage mm -hmm. wd-40 oh yeah you know, is, a, is a is a great one we have wd-40 of course right here in san diego so uh, uh they're real close to us um, um okay i'm gonna i'm gonna circle back for a second okay uh with um uh the musk Bezos, NASA, public-private partnerships like never before in our space future. What do you think of that? I think it's wonderful. I think, I mean, what, what we've got now, it's a partnership of necessity, but, you know, one of the questions I get off is how, come, how could we possibly have canceled the shuttle program without a replacement? It's all about what your focus is and focus equals money. And I say your focus, this terms it's Congress and things like that. Under President Obama, and I'm saying he was wrong for it, I'm just saying he did it. Uh, he canceled uh, most of the contracts from 2011 out because we had other things, wars in Afghanistan, and it's, it depends on the focus of the administration. Well, that left NASA high and dry without a capability on it. Uh, remind me where I'm going with this. 
Oh, no, oh, we're talking about the uh, the significance of the uh, uh, public private oh, private public private yeah so yeah. we can't do it but it's a function of money NASA cannot afford to do to run both the space station go to the moon go to Mars there's not that much money available to us and we know that so what we've done is we've gone to NASA will do those things that Elon and his company probably can't do so well he may prove us wrong on that but commercial enterprise can get to low earth orbit better and more uh, economically than NASA can do so. So let them do that. We will focus on deep space. Now, Elon Musk says he wants to go to Mars and beat us there or to the moon. He may do so. What a wonderful challenge. Uh, <laughs> you you want to see people compete? Give them a challenge. You want to see people start to stagnate? Have no challenge around there. Just let them do whatever they want to. You know, you almost need the impetus of, of competition to really make you do as well as you can do. So I think it's beautiful. And Elon is a good example of you know, lean and mean and just really focus on it. Uh, NASA was that way back in the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo days. We're now a fairly good-sized bureaucracy within NASA, and, and you just tend to grow. But Elon is coming up from scratch again and just making it work. <laughs> We've seen that same thing with, with – what's that? Beat the ponies, man. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Well, we see that same thing with Jeff Bezos and his program. Absolutely. I don't mean to only no, 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 ad admire no. Elon, but uh, yeah, there, there's a number of them coming on. Well, and uh, and Jeff, especially from his belief in how important the moon is to us. Sure. Uh, you know, certainly, um, uh, you know, he's got that, they have that show on uh, Amazon, which we would be familiar with called The Expanse. Mm -hmm. And you'll see, you know, some of the... Uh, 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 of the feelings about how important the moon and deep space, as you said at the very beginning, space is very, very important to us. Absolutely. As a people. So I think that is a, uh, uh, you know, that certainly is a, is a takeaway. The, um, um, so, you know, when you look at Artemis and gateway program, the gateway program and, and returning people to the moon, uh, are you ready to go to the moon? No, okay. I wish I would. If I was thirty-five, <laughs> I would be in line pushing for it. I, I went to a technical session a couple of years back. I mean, they invite us periodically to come back to NASA, back to the astronaut office, and give the old geezers, the old guys. And I used to be the Apollo guys with the old guys for us, and all of a sudden, I'm the old guys for this current generation. But they're going through what they're doing on space station, their plans for the gateway on Orion and going to the moon. Man, I'm so excited. I just wish I was 35 and I could be doing this again. Oh, I wish I was in your shoes. That's why the kids today, it's just, man, it's your turn. It really is. It's, oh, it's awesome what we're doing. No, I, uh, I I couldn't agree more. The uh, uh, so as you're looking at the, all all of this, because mm -hmm. you, you stay abreast of it, okay. What are some of the most exciting elements, okay, to um, uh, to the space program uh, as you see it into the future? We've talked about certainly deep space. We talked about the moon, the Mars. Uh, you know, um, if if you looked at those three or four things that you think are really important <clears throat> why we venture into space again what would they be one of the things we're doing when we go back to moon is this is going to be a a, a commercial partnership again uh, nasa it doesn't say we're going back to the moon we're going forward to the moon when we did apollo the whole goal was to touch the moon and come back safely by the end of the decade. And yeah, we grabbed a couple of rocks, moon rocks. Ooh, wow. Now we're going to go back and we're going to explore. Uh, we're probably going to the south pole of the moon. That has almost a, a perpetual twilight. That's also where there was a major asteroid impact. So you got a gouge that goes maybe half of three quarters of a mile into the moon. So I got asteroid debris. I've got a gouge into the moon so we can see what maybe the moon is made of. Is it different? Is it the same? And we're looking for something that will make deep space economically viable. Uh, if we can find rare earth elements, other things that we simply don't have on earth, uh, because they've gone to the melted core of the earth, but they're still on the surface of the moon, things that we may not even know exist. So we're going to, I believe we're going to find some good stuff. We're also proving the technologies uh, by going to the moon that will let us then go to Mars. Uh, one of them is the engines. 
a uh, classmate of mine, Franklin Chang, are you familiar with the, the Vasimir engine? Yes. Okay. I think it is so cool. I mean, Franklin's a, a classmate of mine. I mean, I flew him back to Rhode Island. He spent the, the night at, you know, at our house with, you know, dinner back up in Rhode Island, and things like that. And uh, so this Vasimir engine, variable, specific impulse, superconducting electromagnetically controlled plasma engine. He takes argon gas and inserts it into the first electromagnetic chamber and heats it with radio frequency waves to a million degrees Fahrenheit. That is now a plasma stripped of electrons, but now it's totally controllable with this superconducting electromagnet shell you've got it in. And then it moves to the next chamber and is and then again heated and spun up almost like you would lighten the laser until it's ready to go out. So now he's spinning this up to 5 million degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> and he's going to eject it at a high percentage of the speed of light. And, you know, it's just Franklin. This, what, this, is, this is crazy. But this is what he's been doing his entire life. When he first came to NASA, you know, when we were new guys back in 1980, he goes, so what is it you do? He says, I work on plasma. You work in blood? <laughs> no, <laughs> plasma, you know. So, okay, that was fun. But, you know, Franklin has just got that thing going. And when that thing is ready, that'll get us to Mars in less than, a, you know, in a month, month and a half or so instead of a year. That's, so, that, that is the real key. Yeah, that solves part of the radiation problem, the food problem, how long we're going to be there. We are going to have to one day be prepared to spend years in transit, if not lifetimes in transit, to go out of the solar systems. But it began building on the shoulders of giants that <laughs> you have to learn how to do it and go there. So it's all exciting. Yeah, you'll leave at age 35 and come back at 75. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, um, um, you know, as we start to wrap this up a little bit, okay, okay you know, and um, uh, I'm going to put you in a couple roles, okay? You're now the NASA administrator, okay? Mm -hmm. What are the first one, two, or three things that you would strongly consider as the NASA administrator to make us better? Us meaning the United States, certainly, as a leader in space. Us as a world leader, meaning, uh, 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 you know, mm -hmm. having some nations, because not all can play on the same uh, ball field, unfortunately, but have some of them involved with us. Uh, and who might those be, okay, uh, that would mm -hmm. steal, steal technology from us that would be, you know, worth, oh, yeah. worth, oh, worth. No need to mention countries or we're getting very political here. I, and I'm trying to stay away from that. Yeah. But, uh, but you're the NASA administrator and a couple things you would, uh, you would consider in that space program for America. Well, I think we've got a good program laid out on going to the moon and potentially to Mars. The key to any good program, though, is the money to make it happen. So I'm looking at the commercial NASA partnerships and how we, how, how we pull those together. When you look at the history of the world in terms of joint programs, the three largest joint programs in the history of the world are okay, the CERN Collider, the International Space Station, and interestingly enough, the F-35. Okay. Leadership in space parlays to leadership on Earth. I mean, our friends on Earth are our friends in space. They want to join us. You know, you guys going to go to the moon on your own? No, but we'd be delighted to join you. And when we go to the moon, it won't be the United States is going to the moon. No, it's we are going to the moon. Uh, it's not the United States' space station. It's the International Space Station. And, and the other nations are very proud of their involvement in it. So I think we're already doing these things as a NASA administrator, maybe emphasize them a little bit more. One thing that NASA was doing when I was a young astronaut is we were actually going out to the various schools, high schools, elementary schools, school systems. And I'm offering that in San Diego if they want to try it with, with me and then we can bring others in as appropriate. But, you know, as part of your program, let's use the technologies and the cool things that are going on in space and probably have to be working through the museum because you've got surrogate, you're the astronaut areas in there. But we could tie these together so they understand it is space, it is technology, it is STEM, and bring the, you know, so that is one thing I'd probably work together or, or try to work a little bit more as the administrator. But I'd also get a good lobby going with, with various senators and congressmen so they understand how important this is to the nation. I think that's an excellent point uh, because I don't necessarily believe that all of the members of Congress understand its importance. 
Okay. Amen. <laughs> and without getting into politics, <laughs> I know. That's just an opinion, sir. Yes, sir. I agree. And, uh, uh, because uh, because you're exactly right. We have to figure out a way to pay for it. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and international is the way to do it. And leading the free world into doing these things are the way it, it should be. Right. And I can I can almost imagine the movie or the book. You know, someday there'll be an ark. Okay, it won't be Noah's ark. It may not be NASA's ark, but there'll be an ark from Earth to go to other solar systems, maybe a series of them, because one or two may fail. Uh, and we're, we're, we're currently looking for Goldilocks planets, planets kind of sort of like Earth. It has got liquid water and an atmosphere, and it's not 20 times the size of Earth, so I'm squished to the size of an ant just by the gravity there. I mean, it's just, it's got to be a Goldilocks type Earth, but they're out there. We got to find them. And we got to figure out how to get there. Well, it sounds like asteroid resorts. How's that? Okay. Okay. Well, um, okay. So uh, this is a little bit free form. What do you want to tell us? What do you want us to know? What do you want the listeners to know? Uh, we're also going to, for all those that are, uh, that are with us today, we're going to be adding some other elements to the uh, overall presentation uh, okay. that, uh, that Woody has uh, uh, researched and, uh, uh, and believes uh, are, are critical to any kind of a presentation such as this. So what do you get to close it out here? You know, you just get to, you know, spill your guts. How's that? <laughs> well, for the older folks, uh, you know, let your congressman, let other folks know that space is important to the world. For your kids and children, help them understand STEM. If they're not big on STEM, that's fine. We need philosophers and we need folks to study ancient English literature and things like that. We need STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. If you have those talents, you'll always have a job. We need them. And keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Uh, you know, it's exciting what's going on. I'm very interested in keeping the excitement going and sharing it. Well, Woody, thank you very much. And uh, 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 for everyone here, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this again, certainly, but uh, uh, Woody and I were able to chat a little bit uh, before uh, we started this. And uh, Woody has been a tremendous uh, supporter and friend of the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Uh, not just uh, not just our space guy, because uh, no. I think I would tell you that our education department says Woody's our astronaut, and uh, and I just want you to know how much we appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate uh, your voice, your vision, and uh, and and that you're an inspiration to those young people who are gonna make those choices in their lives that are so critical to their futures. And as you said earlier making them as early as they possibly can in that STEM focus will give them all sorts of options. Making the choice is important. And you start making that choice at about the sixth grade. Okay. You heard it from Woody Spring. Woody? <laughs> Thanks. Enjoy it, Dave. Sounds like a Walter Cronkite ending, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye.